We hope you enjoy today's message on Acts chapter 2 verse 38 preaching channel. Please like, comment, subscribe, share, and hit the bell to help us grow. Is we're actually going to launch on the lesson called Messages from the Mountain. In other words, this is Jesus on the Mount. Jesus' first sermon is what we see it as. And we're going to explore the Sermon on the Mount. And this one I have entitled Climbing the Mountain. So we're going to get to the destination. And then next week we're going to begin describing what he means by all of these things that he says blessed are. So I'd like you to read with me. We'll read responsively. In other words, let's just uh, read together uh, these scriptures as they pop up on the screen. And I'll try to read in a cadence that's easy. But if we read it all, uh, maybe that will help us to remember what we're reading. So let's begin. And seeing the multitude, he went up on a mountain. And when he was seated... His disciples came to him. Then he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are those are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when they revile and persecute you and say all kind of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceeding glad, for great is your reward in heaven, for so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. So these are what we call the Beatitudes. And as I said a couple weeks ago, I like to just say, this is the attitude I'll be having. Or these are the attitudes I'll be having. So Jesus is talking about needs in the hearts of men and women. This discourse is considered the beginning of Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. And we're not going to study the whole Sermon on the Mount because it covers two and a half chapters. But he is on a hillside somewhere near Capernaum beside the Sea of Galilee. And his disciples are with him. And in this case, it's not just 12 disciples, but there is a host of people with him. Probably hundreds. This... uh, The word disciple actually means a student or a learner. So there are people that are coming to learn from him. They, as you remember perhaps reading the scripture, would later call him rabbi, which meant teacher. So they're coming to hear a teacher. And it's interesting as we are baptizing tonight to realize that usually when somebody began to identify with the teachings of a teacher or a rabbi, they would be baptized by that rabbi or that teacher. So when we see John the baptizer come on the scene and he begins to teach and they ba- he baptizes people, that's a common theme. So you're identifying with the teachings or the disciplines or, or the rigors of the teacher that is teaching. So Jesus finds a place to sit down. Now, that was very often the way that they taught. It's not like we do now. You sit and I stand. Uh, It was the opposite back then often is that you would stand and I would sit. So let's try that tonight (laughs) and see how that works. No, I'm just kidding you. Next Sunday, I'll just make you sit somewhere else. But... uh, Jesus found a place to sit down, and often the instructor would find a centrally located place and make themselves comfortable. And 
Verse 2 had said, and he opened his mouth and taught them. In other words, this was not just off the cuff. That word taught means it was pre-planned, it was organized, he taught with intention. So they weren't just having some kind of casual conversation. Jesus had intention in what he was doing. So there's purpose in the words that he speaks. And there are two major concepts that Jesus covers in what we call the Sermon on the Mount. First, he covers the character of the follower of Christ, such as peacemakers or pure in heart. So there's character that God is talking about. And then the second thing he talks about is the proper attitude towards relationships with the law, with our fellow man, with wealth, etc. And so Jesus covers a broad range of topics, but he's teaching principles. So he says, if you'll be this way, this is your reward. How many of you like rewards? How many of you could care less? You're hired. No, we like to be rewarded for what we do, for whether it's work, and that's as simplistic as that, but there are things that if we do them, we will be rewarded. But it's fitting that the sermon begins with the word blessed. That's the first word. Blessed is the man, or blessed is the man. And notice that in pronouncing the type of individual that is blessed, the Lord is describing their character, the character of a disciple of the Lord and what it ought to be. So he says, if you're going to follow me, this is the kind of character you should have. And this is the reward that you will receive from having that type of character. Now later, Jesus would be just like punch him in the face and said, if you love me, keep my commandments. And that's probably the, the sternest one is that, well, if you love me, do what I say. So he begins to teach these principles, and it's, it's much like the church today is when we talk about uh, those that follow. There are people that come, and they're just casual observers, and they just kind of blow in and blow out, and I don't know what they come for. Sometimes people come to be healed. Uh, I've had people come in and say, I want somebody to prophesy over me, and I said, well, it doesn't work that way. You don't choose when the prophecy comes. God chooses when the prophecy comes, or people have come and said, uh, I, I want money, and uh, I says, well, stay for church, and I might give you money once, but that's it, and let's talk about this, or people want to be healed, or they want, uh, they want a, a group of individuals that looks or acts like them. There's all kinds of reasons, and so there were a whole bunch of people that were gathered there that day, and we know by the time Jesus shook it down, there were 12 that really stuck it out with him, and there were probably 500 on the Mount of Ascension, and only 120 made it to Pentecost. So he's teaching these people, and some are going to receive it, and some are not. And the lesson applies to both types of people, those that are blessed and those that are not. It's an encouragement to, a, to the approaching disciple of the great blessings that are, there are in serving God. And so sometimes when you hear us preach, we'll be telling people, Jesus will give you peace. He'll give you joy. He'll give you a clean conscience because he'll wash your sins away. And we preach about that, and that kind of incentivizes us. Now, most of us, when we first came to, uh, how many of you came, uh, this is kind of revealing. How many of you came to God just to get out of hell free? Anybody? Yeah? Nobody? I know somebody, but they just happen to be walking the parking lot right now because they're an usher. But you said, I'm going to go to church because I want to get right with God because I don't want to go to hell. I mean, that's why I went to the altar the first time. I mean, I was raised in church, you know. I can't remember the first time I saw Pentecostal high heels dancing on the floor. I can't remember the first time I heard somebody speak with other tongues or worship the Lord. But I can, I can remember the first time I knew I was probably a sinner and going to hell because I made it to the altar. But that wasn't enough to keep me because <laughs> God was just going to have to have fear visit my life all the time in order to keep me out of hell. But there are some that come because they're afraid of their eternal destination. 
So it's interesting to notice that this word, what this word blessed means, and we discussed this last week. So blissfully happy, contented, enviable, prosperous, or divinely or supremely favored. So he's basically saying happy is the man that, or the individual, the woman that. If you'll do this, you'll be happy. So happiness is something that we possess. It's an attitude that we have. No, so the blessed isn't like, okay, usually we think, it's like somebody says, oh, where'd you get that? Oh, God bless me. You know, I have this. It's a blessing from God. So that's the connotation we usually have for blessing is something that would gift it to us by God. But here God is saying, this is the kind of attitude you'll end up with if you'll take this approach to living. So we have got to take the right approach to living. So the blessed actually does not refer to the disciples as recipients a blessing from God or man, but rather as possessors of happiness. Happiness isn't something that God gives us. Joy he gives us, but he doesn't get ha- give us happy. We decide to be happy, don't we? You know, I don't know where he got it from, and he's probably dead now. Don't worry, be happy. You know, he just sang it over and over and over again. I think there was a verse to it, but don't worry, be happy. Bobby McFerrin or something like that. It's just like, it was just that cadence and, and, and the song, ooh, you know, the music all went with it. He's trying to set his tone. He says, just chill out. Don't worry about this. Be happy. He doesn't say, God's not saying if your circumstances change, you'll be happy. But he says, if your approach to life changes, you'll be happy. You ever had your approach to life change and it really revolutionized the way you felt? Maybe it was when we surrendered to the Lord Jesus Christ. So we're talking about action is the blessing. So action equals being blessed. So if we take the right actions in our life, we will be blessed. So I'm going to read some scriptures. There's five scriptures that we're going to read here. And Jesus is talking to uh, his disciples and they're uh, going to do foot washing. And he he encourages them to uh, have foot washing. And in John chapter number 13 and verse number 17, he says, If you do these things, happy are ye if ye do they. If you know these things, I'm sorry. Happy are ye if you do them. So he says, uh, you know, it's kind of awkward to wash somebody's feet, isn't it? We don't do that much anymore, do we? How many of what you wash your own? Okay, we got a problem here. (laughs) You weren't expecting that question, were you? It's like, wait a minute. You're not listening. No, but they would walk dusty roads and they wore sandals. They had open uh, shoes. And when they come to a house to have dinner or, or they were being received for some event, uh, the lowest servant in the household would uh, wash their feet. Number one, because it was refreshing. And number two, so they wouldn't track dirt all over the house. And so he says, but you are washing one another's feet to show your submitted to each other. And he says, happy are ye if you do them. And 1 Kings 10 and 8, he says, happy are thy men. This is a, a visitation of uh, the queen of Sheba. And she's coming and looking at Solomon. And he says, happy are thy men. Happy are thy servants, uh, which stand continually before thee and that hear thy wisdom. He says, because they stand before you and hear your wisdom, they're happy. Happiness is something that people notice. We mentioned that last week, but we talk, called it joy. We read for Samuel, uh, our Psalms 1 and 1. Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, or standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. And that blessed is the same word for happy. In chapter 32, David writes, Blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. He says, you're going to be happy if you know that your sin is covered. Now, it's one thing to know that the bill is covered, but it's another thing to know that you're free. 
And you and I need to rejoice. And once I found out, hey, I was baptized like Jordan, my sins are gone. That's a happy feeling, isn't it? You kind of put it together. And, and sometimes we feel free when we come out of the baptismal tank, even when we don't realize all that happened. But once we realize what happened, it's like, woohoo! Yeah, I like this. And then Psalm chapter number 84 and verse 5, he says, Blessed is the man whose strength is in thee and whose heart are the ways of them. So he says, if our strength is in God, we're happy. I'm happy to know that God is fighting for me. I'm happy to know that he washed my sins away. I'm happy that I belong to him. So these scriptures, we see that this type of blessing is not a gift to be received, but rather a state of mind or spirit to be achieved and maintained. So it's not like, God, make me happy. You ever ask God to make you happy? Thank you. Who said that? I have too. God, make me content. Make me happy. Make me joyful. There's a lot of things I pray for. Make me love my neighbor. Anybody ever had to pray that? Anybody's neighbor ever had to pray that? Yeah, I thought so. Yeah, sometimes that happens. <laughs> you know, if, if, if we say, okay, God, I ask God, I say, Jesus, help me to love people like you love me. Because if, if he doesn't help me with that, I'm not going to get the job done that he called me to do is go make disciples. Because there's going to be an irritant of something along the way, whether it's a personality thing or, or something they do that I see as offensive or inconvenient to me. So I pray and ask God, make me this way. And, he said, and we say, God, make me happy. I can go back to the Sermon on the Mount. And he says, I'll tell you some things that will make you happy. Here's some approaches to life that will make you happy. If, you, if we decide that we're going to be content with the wages that we have, and I'm not against a, a raise or a pay raise. I left several jobs for a pay raise it, because, well, I'm doing the same job, make more money. Yeah, I'll go to work for more money. I mean, usually we don't do that. But sometimes when we decide to be content, we become great employees and we set ourselves up for better pay. And there's a difference, and we become content. That means we willfully do whatever it is the boss asks us to do. And when we do that, he says, man, they're a star employee. Believers should be the best employees that any employer should have. Hey, you don't come to work drunk or with a hangover. You don't steal from them. You don't cause trouble. You don't cause drama on the job. I mean, you're a pretty good guy. I mean, you got a leg up right away, and we're honest. So another way to put it would be to say that it's a blessing that becomes an integral part of the spirit because of another blessing received. So, for example, the joy of the Lord is our strength. The blessing is the strength because we have the joy of the Lord. When we have joy and we have determined that our joy is going to be in God, not in this world, our hope is in the name of the Lord, our help is in the name of the Lord, that we decide we're going to be joyful, we feel strong. Because we've allowed the Lord to be victorious over our sins. So, by beginning with the word, Jesus is blessed, Jesus is literally saying, happy is the one who does all of these things. So we got a list of to-dos. How many like to-do lists? How many hate to-do lists that others give you? Yeah, yeah. Us guys call them a... Oh, some of you girls know what it is too. You probably named it. Honey, do this, right? So we got a honey-do list. And, well, if I do this... <laughs> What do I get? A little reprieve? Can I go sit in the hammock for a while if I do this? Oh. So God gives us kind of a to-do list. I like that because living for God shouldn't be some mystery. Is like, do I know I'm saved? Or how do I find joy or happiness? Or how do I receive forgiveness or remission of my sins? God, it's not just an in. Have you ever been in a relationship that you just weren't sure about people? 
Oh, good. Thank you. <laughs> One day, they like sweet tea, and the other day, they hate sugar in their tea. <laughs> One day, they think you're thin enough. The next day, you're not. You, you... <laughs> You love it because he brought flowers to you, and then the next time you wonder what he did to bring flowers to you. <laughs> you know, it's that flip-flop thing. Because we as humans can be that way sometimes. It's like my kids have this thing is that uh, at Thanksgiving time, we have acorn squash on the table and a few other times. How many of you like acorn squash? Okay. How many don't like it? How many ate it even though you didn't like it? <laughs> How many ate it because you didn't like it because you were told you had to? Or because you didn't want to offend somebody? Yeah, okay. Well, in our house, we had acorn squash, and I'd eat it, and I hated it. Now, when my kids were all raised and out of the house, they found that out. And they said, you made us eat squash? for 18 years or 20 years while we were at home and you didn't like it? That's right. Eat it or beat it. <laughs> That's not. And so now, every time we have acorn squash, our kids laugh about it and my grandkids know. That their kids, poor daddy and mommy, had to eat squash and they didn't like it. I don't think any of my grandkids love acorn squash. They just don't like it. I don't mind the brown sugar that's in the middle and the butter. I mean, if you just let me scoop that out and you can have the rest, go for it, baby. There's a reason why you got to have that brown sugar and butter. Because otherwise it's not worth eating in my estimation. So there are things that... We don't do because we don't see the benefit of them. It, uh, we ate that to make somebody else happy. But once we got to a point where we didn't have to, we just said, I'm never going to eat that again. And there were foods that probably you ate at home and you said, never again. And uh, I remember a story being told by Brother Paul Mooney. And uh, this was at a marriage retreat. And it was right. And he says, uh, when he was a kid, he remembers that he cut the butter, you know, the cube butter, not in the, uh, and he cut the butter, and if it was crooked, his mom did not like that. So she trained it, everybody in the house to cut the butter straight. Kind of like rolling your corn on it, right? So it, they cut the butter straight, and all his growing up years, that just bothered him, and so he said, uh, when him and Sister Mickey got married, uh, they got back from their honeymoon and they went shopping. And when they got home, uh, put everything away and she made their first home-cooked meal. And uh, he said, they sat down, they prayed over the meal, and he grabbed his knife and just went, ha, ya, 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 to the butter. And she said, don't do that to the butter! And he realized that he was going to have to cut his butter straight the rest of his life. <laughs> because he married somebody just like his mom, as far as that was concerned. Because there's things we'd like to be liberated from, and we think that would make us happy if we're liberated from them. But he said it was worth living with her to not cut the butter crooked. <laughs> so... Know that each beatitude would still be true even if there was no promise to the follower. So, but Jesus is kind of incentivizing them. This is his first sermon. So he's putting the hook in. And he said, if, then, if, then, if, then. And these people are thinking, maybe I could try this out and see if it works. So the truth is, that a man should still be happy when he's poor in spirit, whether or not the kingdom belongs to him. Now, we're going to talk about what poor in spirit is because that's a little confusing, huh? So one would be happy 
even during mourning if, regardless of the comfort, if nobody's there to comfort. He says, blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. That doesn't mean man will comfort you, but God will comfort you. Happy is the one who is meek. And meek means, doesn't mean weak, but it means having resolve. Whether or not there is an inheritance, because he said the meek will inherit the earth. There are benefits of being meek. So we're going to talk about meekness. Uh, next week is one of the things we're going to be talking about is meekness. And you can be hungry and still be happy. And I hear a term all the time, I'm hangry. <laughs> and sometimes I get that way. That's a term we use, right? It's like, I'm hangry. I'm, get, I'm so hungry, I'm getting aggravated here. But he says, you can do without, but still be happy. And people that are merciful can still be happy when they're not shown mercy. So Jesus is trying to show us that there are attitudes that we can have irregardless of what other people do. I've mentioned this dozens of times over this pulpit. My mom used to say to me, change your attitude. And I figured out real quick I could. Because if I didn't, she had something that would assist me in changing my attitude. And sometimes God lets things happen in my life to correct my attitude if I don't get my attitude correct. So oftentimes when I'm going through a struggle, I say, God, help me to learn from this what you're trying to teach me from this because I really don't want to do this again. And oftentimes, God will use something or natural consequences. And happiness of the pure in heart is not dependent upon having to see God at every turn in life. He says, but blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. But we don't have to see God all, all the time to be happy. I'm happy that he has saved me from myself and from my sin and the eternal consequence of sin. And if I never see his action in my life, at least I know the end result is what I'm looking for. And people that are peacemakers enjoy happiness without regard to lineage. And, and God tells us some things that will happen and then people that are persecuted for righteousness sake and that's not because you're a jerk but because you're doing what is right those people for righteousness sake are happy because they know where their future is it's in heaven so if we can adjust our mindset to do the right thing irregardless of the reward then the reward will follow and that's like the icing on the cake. That's like, a, that's like the extra that we got that wasn't necessary. Because we know that God's word is true. We know that God's word will never, ever change. And he will keep his word. Jesus was in no wise trying to d dangle a carrot before their nose. You know, like the old comic. You got the donkey going just because there's a carrot just a few inches before. Have you ever had that done to you some way in life? We've all had that done to you. If then, well, well you'll get a raise. Well, if then, then I'll do this. And there's, because we make promises we can't keep. And sometimes people make promises they never intend on keeping. And, and the carrot's always out there. It's going to get better. It's going to get better. Jesus isn't saying it's going to get better without the promise of it getting better. Jesus doesn't just dangle carrots in front of our noses. He said, if then. This is the beautiful thing about Jesus is that, you know, we talk about science and I've heard that term a lot lately. Follow the science. Just so you know, science got us evolution. Just so you know. So uh, when they say follow the science, science is not a hard fact thing. It's a discovery thing, right? If you see something... To discover the truth, you see if you can uh, do an experiment that has repeatable results. If the results are not repeatable, then it changes. And you've got to find repeatable results. And so science is not something that's written in stone and never will change, right? 
There were things that we thought about electricity back in the 1800s as humankind that, that have been disproved in our generation. And uh, they thought it wasn't harnessable, thought it wasn't profitable. And they've gone all kinds of different ways around just electricity. There are things that we thought, uh, just how many of you thought that if you went out in the cold, you'd catch a cold? That's an old wives' tale. I don't know how old the wife was, but it's an old wives' tale. <laughs> That's not what happens, but I was, I was told that all my life. You're going to catch a cold. Well, that's not what you catch a cold from. Your immune system may go down if you're out exposed to the cold. But a cold doesn't come from the cold. It's probably an incubator that's warm is where more likely a cold would come from. Because the cold would probably kill the cold. Or you. Then the cold's killed too. So it's not a big deal. But those are old wives' tales. So we've been told, don't do this or this will happen. Do this and this will happen. How many of you know what mercuricome is and mephialate? Those two things would fix everything when I was a kid. How many of you have never heard of those? Oh, you're under 40. Well, or 45. Uh, it was, you know, you got it something, you got a cut, here we go methylate or mercuricome here we're gonna why it's a disinfectant it's something that will clean the wound and so uh, that was always in the medicine cabinet I bet we don't have I haven't seen it in years how many how many have that in your medicine cabinet fix anything right I used, yeah it works <laughs> but we found newer and better things now we use triple antibiotic ointment, right? How many's heard of that? Uh, even some of you that are under 40 have heard of that. And you squeeze that on the cut and put a Band-Aid on it, and eventually it helps to heal because it disinfects and it helps to heal. So what we know is that science moves along and it changes, but the Word of God doesn't. These are absolutes that are fixed. That we don't have to say, God said, oops, made a mistake on that one, man. Gabriel, could you run on down there and tell those the guys that the pure in heart will not see me? No, God hasn't changed his word. It's forever settled in heaven. And so Jesus is trying to teach them that the true disciple learns to be happy regardless of the promised blessings. Now, if we can do it just because we love him, then the blessing is superfluous or it's an extra. Listen to what Paul said at the end of his life or toward the end of his life in Philippians 4 and 11. Not that I speak with regard, with respect of want, for I have learned in whatsoever state I am therewith to be content. Now, there's two things that I want us to see here is first, he said, I don't speak in regard of any want or need. Did Paul ever have a time where he had need in his life? You read 1 Corinthians chapter number 11, and it's like, here's my resume. Can I get a job as an apostle? You know, I've been beaten three times, 39 stripes. I have a day and a night I've spent in the deep. I've been shipwrecked. I've been abused by uh, a false brother, and I've been abused uh, by the Roman government. Uh, I, I've been robbed. I've been left for dead. Uh, I've been in nakedness. I've been in cold. I've been in fatigue. And, and he says, plus all the care of the churches. But here he said, I have learned in whatsoever state I am therewith to be content. In other words, we can learn to be content, or we can learn to be happy. And so I had decided that I'm going to be happy no matter what. I'm going to be happy if I'm broke or there's plenty of money in the bank, and I've been both. I'm going to happy, be happy if my boss is a jerk or if he's a good guy. And I've had both, and sometimes I've been both. So it's like I've decided I'm going to be content in my life. So Paul says he learned to be content. He realized that there were future blessings that were available to him. So evidently, Paul 
had heard the Sermon on the Mount and he realized his happiness was not dependent upon circumstances. He said, I'm not going there. We're not going to base my happiness on circumstances. If Paul would have done that, he would have been of all men most miserable. And he said, you know, if my hope was in this life only, I would be of all men most miserable. But his hope wasn't in this life only. It was in the life to come. So the Apostle Paul realized that there were future blessings for being faithful and they were dependent upon his present state of being. In other words, I'm going through what I'm going through so God can make me something better for the future and I'm going through what I'm going through but there's a reward on the other side of whatever I'm going through. He was going to be faithful. And as we stand, I'm going to read 2 Timothy 4, and this is Paul, and he's speaking to his young protege, and he says this, but watch thou in all things, endure afflictions, do the work of evangelists, fulfill your ministry, for I am already being poured out as a drink offering, and the time of my departure is at hand. I have fought a good fight, I have finished the race, I have kept the faith. Finally, there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give me on that day. And not to me only, but also to all who have loved his appearing. He said, you know what? I did all of this, and I know there's something on the other side. But it's not just for me. It's for everybody that loves his appearing. And I have to admit to you, there's some things I do because I believe there's a reward on the other side. I can't wait for the new heavens and new earth where and dwelleth righteousness. I don't know what it's going to be like, but if when Jesus, when God was done creating everything, he said it was very good. It's going to be even better than that, I'm sure, when we get to the other side because there's no evil, there's no tempter, there's no chance of it ever becoming polluted. I'm waiting for that day. I'm waiting for that moment when I awaken his likeness and he says, hey, all your flaws are gone. Hey, your struggles are gone. Hey, you'll never sin again. No, you'll never fall. Don't worry about it. Just chill. Just relax. I've got something for you to do for eternity that you're going to enjoy. Because God has a plan for you and me. Blessed. So we're going to go over each one of these and there will be multiple of these in each lesson and say, what is it to be meek? What does he mean, the pure in heart? What do you mean, persecuted for righteousness' sake? And we'll see. If we'll do this, if we'll have these attitudes, we'll be happy. We'll be blessed. Dear Jesus, let your blessings flow upon your body. Let your peace flow in this house. We want to be happy, and we want that joy and that happiness to draw men to you. We want that happiness to draw men to your love and your grace and your peace and your principles. Thank you for your goodness. Thank you for your kindness. And thank you for your love. We intend to serve you with joyfulness. In Jesus' name, amen. In Jesus' name.